When we think of democracy, we probably think of our freedoms, our God-given rights, the belief that the majority in favor of something will prevail. The roots of democracy date all the way back to Athens, Greece in the 7th century BC, but it wasn't widely popularized until the ratification of the United States Constitution. When a group of people decided to stand up against an unruly monarchy in favor of the idea of the popular vote. Many people are able to make these connections when thinking of democracy. But one thing that definitely doesn't cross their minds when mentioning democracy, piracy. Almost a century before the founding of the United States, there was an extremely diverse group of pirates consisting of men from many different cultures and ethnic backgrounds. But what these men all had in common was the belief in the majority rule. These men were captained by a man who also believed in freedom and fairness in the way he ran his, well, criminal operation. Sounds good, right? Well, I suppose that depends on which side of the coin you fell on. On a warming spring day in April of 1717, democracy would not land in Captain Beer's favor. 40 leagues or 130 miles off the coast of South Carolina, a sloop, which is a smaller one-masted sailboat, was traveling back to its home port in Boston. Captain Beer was in command of the ship sailing back to Boston with a crew of maybe 40 men or so. In the distance, they could see a large galley ship coming toward them. Traditionally, a galley ship existed for one of two reasons, to make trade or make war. At the rate the ship was sailing toward the sloop, I think you can guess what was coming next. The pirates sailed right up to the sloop and commanded Captain Beer and his men to board their vessel while they plundered the payload. Upon completion of the supremely one-sided transfer, the commander of the galley ship was ready to let Captain Beer return to his vessel and sail away. But just as he always did, he put the decision to a vote with his men, democracy, if you will, at its finest. His men would ultimately elect to sink the sloop But the captain of the galley ship would extend his hand and offer Captain Beer a place in his fleet. This now famous speech begins with a slew of curse words, which I will omit for my younger audience. Quote, I am sorry they won't let you have your sloop again, for I scorn to do anyone a mischief when it is not for my advantage. Darn the sloop, we must sink her, and she might be of use to you. Though you are a sneaking puppy, And so are all those who submit to be governed by laws which rich men have made for their own security. For the cowardly whelps have not the courage otherwise to defend what they get by their knavery. Darn them for a pack of rascals, and you, who serve them, for a parcel of hen-hearted numbskulls. They vilify us, the scoundrels do. When there is only this difference, they rob the poor under the cover of law, forsooth and we plunder the rich under the protection of our own courage. Had you better not make one of us than sneak after those villains for employment? Captain Beer would decline his offer. Quote, My conscience will not allow me to break through the laws of God and man. This prompted an infuriated response from the pirate captain. Quote, You are a devilish conscientious rascal. I am a free prince and I have as much authority to make war on the whole world as he who has a hundred sail of ships at sea and an army of one hundred thousand men in the field. And this my conscience tells me. But there is no arguing with such sniveling puppies who allow superiors to kick them about the deck at pleasure and pin their faith upon a pimp of a parson, a squab, who neither practices nor believes what he puts upon the chuckle-headed fools he preaches to." End quote. This speech to Captain Beer was delivered to him by Captain Black Sam Bellamy, the wealthiest pirate known to history. It wasn't greed that drove him, no. It was an anger at the corrupt English system that exploited him and other poor boys just like him. His amassed wealth was a possible nod to the democracy that he ran. 
I'm Bradley Hall, and you're listening to Beyond the Harbor. Before becoming known as Black Sam, Samuel Bellamy was born in England on February 23rd of 1689. He most likely grew up poor and plowed the fields as a farmer just as his parents did. At the age of 13, though, he decided to flip the script and became a ship's boy. In this role, he would learn much about sailing while performing his daily chores for the captain and crew. During his time as a ship's boy, the War of Spanish Succession was ongoing. It is not known as to how much wartime Bellamy actually witnessed but by the end of the war in 1712, he was now a 23-year-old, well-skilled sailor. The treatment Bellamy was exposed to in the Royal British Navy would be a primary driving factor in his hatred of the kingdom later on down the road. Sailors were regularly cheated of their wages and oftentimes received IOUs. Sometimes they were never compensated at all for their time at sea. It is easy sometimes to jump to conclusions, especially about pirates due to their reputation. But after being under this sort of treatment for a decade, it sheds a little more light behind the actions he would later take in his adventures in piracy. In 1714, Bellamy would set sail for Cape Cod, where he would arrive in Eastham. It is reported that he probably had relatives here. After settling in, he began to get acquainted with the people of the town. He met a young lady named Goody Hallett. She was about 16 years old at this time. The decade split between Hallett and Bellamy did not mean much to either of them, and they soon struck up a romantic relationship. It was said that her father did not think much of Bellamy, as he was a poor sailor. He believed there were better options out there for his daughter. Despite his thoughts of Bellamy, The relationship between the two continued on behind the scenes. In early 1716, Bellamy would leave Cape Cod en route to the Florida coast to seek treasure from the 1715 wreck of a Spanish fleet that was said to be loaded down with gold and silver. Upon his departure, Hallett had a surprise bun in the oven. Bellamy, though, was not aware of this and continued on his journey to Florida. She hid the pregnancy from everyone as she would be ridiculed to be found pregnant out of wedlock. Local Cape Cod lore indicates that Bellamy would soon return to marry her, and she would wait for him. What a grueling time this must have been for Goody Hallett, bearing a child and eagerly awaiting the return of her lover to deliver the good news. She was said to have given birth to a baby boy and hid the child in a barn. While out gathering up food, the child choked to death on the straw in the barn. She was arrested for the murder of her son and imprisoned in the old jail of Barnstable, Massachusetts. This jailhouse subsequently still stands to this day. It is the oldest wooden jailhouse in the United States. Some people believe that she still may be hanging around there, but I digress. With another show of democracy, the town leaders held a vote and she was exiled from the town of Eastham and forced to move a bit north to the town of Wellfleet. It was said that she moved right onto the ocean and became a recluse, watching the horizon day and night until the day Sam would hopefully return for her. We will come back to Goody Hallett later on in this episode, but for now let's catch back up with Bellamy en route to the Florida coast to search for the sunken treasures. He had teamed up with Paul's grave Williams, who was the son of the Rhode Island Attorney General, John Williams. The two men apparently did not have much success on their hunt for gold and silver from the sunken Spanish fleet. Still seeking their share of the fortune, they turned to piracy, joining up with Captain Benjamin Hornigold and his first mate, Edward Teach, on a ship called the Mary Ann. Sound familiar? I thought so. After a few months of serving under Captain Hornigold, in the summer of 1716, the pirate crew began to grow tired of his unwillingness to attack vessels from his home country of England. 
The crew took a vote and ultimately decided to relieve Hornigold of his position on the Marianne. His loyal followers, including Blackbeard, packed up and left the Marianne. As you heard in episode one, Blackbeard's story, though, was just beginning. This left the remaining 90-man crew aboard the Marianne with a decision to be made on who they would elect as their new captain. As a strike of fate, they unanimously chose Bellamy, now known to everyone as Black Sam Bellamy, to be the captain of the Mary Ann. The crew then went on to capture a second ship known as the Sultana. The Sultana now needed its own captain. Again, under the guise of democracy, Black Sam put it to a vote. His friend and accomplice he sailed to the Florida coast with, Paul's Grave Williams, was made the captain over the Sultana, with which I'm sure a popular endorsement from Bellamy. They would go on to spend the better part of a year plundering and raiding other merchant ships. In late February of 1717, Black Sam spotted a galley ship sailing through the Windward Passage between Hispaniola and Cuba. It was the Wada Galley, and Black Sam knew he had to make it his own. After a three-day pursuit, he fired a single shot at the Wada in hopes that they would surrender to limit the damage. Captain Lawrence Prince lowered the flag on the mast to signal a surrender. The Wada Galley now had a new commander. The vessel was massive for its time. It was a 300-ton, 102-foot-long galley ship that could sail at speeds in excess of 15 miles an hour. Absolutely blazing, right? Upon the capture, the Wada's cargo holds were full of treasures. Black Sam had finally struck gold. To keep up the theme of democracy, Black Sam and his crew elected to trade the Sultana for the Wada. This is about as one-sided as a trade can be. However, I suppose they could have just killed them and kept the Sultana for themselves. But this was not who Black Sam was or what he stood for. He went on to take the Wada as his flagship, and Paul's grave Williams became captain over the Mary Ann after his ship, the Sultana, was traded using heavy air quotes here, for the Wada Galley. The pirates got to work immediately, upgrading the Wada to a whopping 28 cannons and loading the cargo bays full of ammunition. They would be ready to take on any Royal Navy ship at this point and most likely have the upper hand. For the next couple of months, Black Sam and his crew, along with Captain Williams aboard the Mary Ann, continued their reign of terror along the coast of the colonies. Like Blackbeard, He was able to capture most of the vessels without firing a single shot. His reputation of kindness, for lack of a better word, preceded him. Everyone knew they would have their payloads raided, but they would escape death. Black Sam was a striking figure of his time, unmistakable to anyone who came in contact with him. Quote, He made a dashing figure in his long deep cuff velvet coat, knee breeches, silk stockings, and silver buckled shoes, with a sword slung on his left hip and four pistols on his sash. Unlike some of his fellows, Black Sam never wore the fashionable powdered wig, but grew his dark hair long and tied it back with a satin bow. All of this to say, if you came across Black Sam, you had no question on who you were in the presence of. Black Sam and his crew would soon sail up on the sloop that Captain Beer was sailing back to Boston. This speech that we discussed earlier is where we get an actual inside look at the thought process behind the decisions he ultimately made during his time in piracy. As we know, the crew elected to sink the sloop against what Black Sam had wanted, but he still managed to spare Captain Beer's life. After sinking Captain Beer's sloop in the spring of 1717, the Wada and Mary Ann set their sails north toward New England. They split up in Rhode Island so that Williams could visit his family there. His father was the attorney general there, after all, and I'm sure the locals were wondering what his son was up to. But Black Sam and his flagship continued north, appearing to head back from whence he had came just a few years prior, possibly returning back to his lover Goody Hallett in Eastham. The reunion, though, would never happen. 
she would never see Samuel Bellamy again. On April 26th of 1717, just off the coast of Cape Cod, a violent storm blew up on the horizon. It drove the Wida onto a sandbar just 500 feet from the coast of what is now known as Wellfleet, Massachusetts. At around 15 minutes past midnight, the ship's mast snapped in half and sent her capsizing into the sea where it quickly sank. The Wida took Black Sam along with 144 of his 146 man crew to the bottom of the ocean. At just 28 years of age, Black Sam's terror reign on the seas came to an abrupt end. He had failed to reunite with his lover and enjoy the spoils of his riches that he had amassed. After a little over a year of the pirate life, he managed to capture 54 vessels and their loot. This caused Black Sam to dub himself as Robin Hood of the Sea. This flows along with the narrative that Black Sam lived by, the creed in which he was stealing from the rich to give to the poor. I believe it was his mistreatment over a decade in the Royal Navy that led him to believe that he was actually doing everyone a service instead of a criminal activity. This loot made Black Sam the most wealthiest pirate in history. It would total around $120 million in today's currency, according to Forbes magazine. It was said that 104 bodies washed ashore on Wellfleet and were buried by the town's coroner. This left 40 bodies unaccounted for. It is believed that none of the bodies that were recovered were that of Black Sam, as he was an unmistakable character to miss. The two living survivors were escorted back to Boston, where they were tried and convicted of piracy. They were hanged in November of 1717. The sudden and unexpected death of Black Sam left his lover Goody Hallett still waiting for his return in Wellfleet. There's a lot of local Cape Cod lore that surrounds Goody and the events that unfolded that night in April of 1717. As none of it can really be disputed, I will discuss it here because, well, it makes for a good story. On the night the storm rolled in, just 500 feet off the shore was Black Sam and the Wada Galley. Some villagers were said to have spotted Goody on top of a bluff, looking out in dismay as the ship was ripped to pieces by the wind and waves. Some later accounts state that she could be heard cursing the storm as it was taking down her long-lost lover. They claimed that she eventually reached the wreck site by rowboat and began the hunt for Black Sam. After making several unsuccessful attempts, she then loaded her boat with as much treasure as she could and buried it deep within the dunes of Wellfleet. The location is said to be along the walking trails of where she and Sam had charted their future together upon his return. Those who visit the location to this day say that Goody Hallett, later known as the Witch of Wellfleet, and her lover Black Sam have never left the dunes. Though it be the end of the story for Black Sam and Goody Hallett, it would not be the end of their legacy. The story of Black Sam and the Wada Galley would lay dormant for 267 years, both figuratively and literally. But in 1984, the history and lore surrounding the famous pirate captain would be brought back to the surface. Hang around a minute, and I'll tell you all about it. When the Wada Galley went down in 1717, the governor of Massachusetts sent a cartographer, Cypriot Southhag, to recover what he could of the wreck site. The conditions were rough and the sailors weren't able to recover much due to not being able to make it to the shore of the wreck site. He said that many other locals had beat him to it and likely collected all the bounty that had washed ashore. But what he managed to do was keep important documentation and also a map that he made of the wreck site. A map, you see, turned out to be a great idea coming from a cartographer. Who would have guessed that? Underwater archaeological explorer Barry Clifford 
had a team on the hunt for the Wada Galley in the 1980s. They were primarily using the maps and notes that Southack had made in 1717 during his time spent surveying the site. These maps and notes were as true to life as pop culture modern day treasure maps as there's ever been. And some people laughed at the idea that Clifford could actually locate the vessel by these means. Clifford and his team would have to account for almost 300 years of natural sea erosion, as well as other landmarks that were non-existent, such as the natural canal called Jeremiah's Gutter, which was completely gone. Barry Clifford made headlines in 1984 when he claimed that he had found the Wida, and in 1985, just under 14 feet of water and 5 feet of sand, Clifford recovered the ship's bell with the inscriptions written, The Wida Galley, 1716. This confirmed the suspicions that Clifford had that this was indeed the final resting place of the Wida and her legendary captain, Black Sam. Over the years, 200,000 individual pieces have been retrieved from the wreck site. Clifford and his team continue to dive the site annually and almost always bring up new treasures. One of the items that strikes me as very fascinating, as if it could be any more fascinating, is the finding of a child's black leather shoe with a silk stocking and fibula bone. At the time the Wida was sailing, it was famously known that there was a boy of about 10 years of age sailing with the pirates. His name was John King. John chose the pirate's life on his own initiative when Black Sam captured a ship that he was sailing on with his mother. It was said that he was so insistent on joining the pirates that he threatened to hurt himself if she did not allow him to go. His mother later gave a statement to the local port authorities and described what he was wearing at the time. His attire, you see, included long silk stockings. After amassing much treasures from the site, Clifford established the, quote, Expedition Wida Sea Lab and Learning Center, located in Provincetown, Massachusetts. This museum houses all of the artifacts that is brought up from the wreck site to this day, which can all be viewed on display. In 2018, Scientists thought they had identified the remains of Bellamy when they found a skeleton in the wreck. It contained a pistol and a pocket full of gold. DNA tests would be compared to a relative that Barry Clifford and his team had located from Bellamy's hometown of Devon, England. The test would come back as an Eastern Mediterranean male, but not Bellamy himself. However, just this year in February, the remains of at least six more pirates were found in the shipwreck. They were identified in several large concretions. With Bellamy's DNA on hand, they hoped that the modern-day cutting-edge technology can help them positively identify the man himself. Until then, the legend and folklore that surrounds Black Sam, his loyal followers, and the pirate democracy that they were all a part of will live on with the retelling of his stories just like this one. This episode was written and produced by me, Bradley Hall. If you enjoyed this story as we explored the history of Black Sam, please be sure to like, rate, and subscribe. You can find us on Instagram by searching for Beyond the Harbor. Questions, comments, and feedback can be left at my website. As always, if you are looking to take a deeper dive into the history of Black Sam, the source material used for this episode can be found on my website, along with full transcripts of all the episodes. Thanks for listening.